This rainy season was something that I've never experienced in Malawi. Okay, so this is the type of storms we've been facing during this time. Here at the Crown Base, we haven't had any damage except for some trees that has fallen down, some of the maize plants that has been blown down, and uh, some of the roofs that I had to repair here and there. Uh, but other than that, everything is actually fine, and we're all healthy and strong, and very busy trying to help the people around us. Of course, the areas that's been affected the most, where people are really displaced and stranded at the moment, are places like the Lower Shiri Valley. The Shiri River has been flooded everywhere. And so people who've been living along the banks of the river, they've been affected a lot. In Chalu, that's just the one town that we visited, there were 3,000 people displaced alone. And if you go further down south in Sanje and Gabu, there's many more of thousands of people being displaced. Yeah, what we have heard and this it's, it's being reported here is like there were people coming from their uh, men's field and what happened was uh, the water could come to them but uh, could round them and they were in the middle of the water. And what these people did to really being rescued themselves from the water, they went up into the tree and they have been staying in the tree for three days and they were very weak until the water was coming down and from there they had to like go to, uh, to the hospital for some help. When the areas where there's no flooding because of the elevation, there's still thousands of houses that has fallen but just because of the continuous rain. Most people here cannot afford to uh, build houses with cement. So they would fire their own bricks many times, but then use clay as mortar. When this white plaster starts coming off in the rain, then the whole house will crumble. Um, and that's the problem most of these houses have had. Okay, so as we're walking along, we're seeing a lot of homeowners busy rebuilding. So as you can see, they've got stones and um, some clay that they're going to mix up, uh, which they're busy mixing further along to try and rebuild and repatch their homes. I'm a top The house broke down um, during the rain and he's gone in and trying to salvage some of the materials that he can still use to rebuild his home. Um, as you can see there's parts of the house that are still, these calendars and pictures that are still on the wall um, that have been um, left after the rain. It's obviously inhospitable and nobody can stay in this. The house that we can see there somebody has dead uh, you know after the war has fallen on him so these are the people coming from that funeral yeah this river is washed away as you can see um, some families are busy washing their clothes and bathing in the water if you have a look at the pollution and the rubble it stinks it really stinks here and um, the sanitation level is really bad I, I can only imagine the stuff that's actually living in the water um, and families are forced to resort to washing and bathing in this water because there's nothing else available for them. We've come along across a lot of homes. They've got toilets like this one here, where the structures have fallen and now they, they can't use the toilets. But also all that excrement has now become exposed into the water, the local water. Um, and it's probably just waiting for a cholera outbreak to take place with this. The families who don't have toilets anymore, they've been able to go to friends and relatives who do have toilets. As you can see, we've got a toilet here that has been exposed and eroded away by the rains. Um, it's filled up with water, but obviously it's a hazard. There's lots of children, as you can see, around us. Um, and it's just open to diseases as well for the community. This is one of many that we're seeing. 
and all along the riverbank we have toilets that are situated right next to the bank and the excrement flows off into the water and the ladies are now washing and bathing in that water <laughs> um, but yeah, most of the, the toilets have been washed away due to the, the, the river that came down The rain is falling on bare ground and there's nothing holding the rain and it just comes down with rolling big rocks down and, and mud uh, so several houses have been totally swept away by these downpours and, and, and downflows of water from the mountain sides. It was very early in the morning when we heard a loud noise and the water just came like a wall falling and it washed away all the people that were close to the stream. It was a small stream that we could not bring any water. It has come from the mountain because the mountain is bare. It has no trees. So this place was a house. A secondary school teacher was residing there. We are, as I said, we have buried him yesterday, but his son is, is nowhere to be found. But there are a lot of corpses that we haven't found. Yes, that's how severe the flooding has been here in Chimankunda. But the water, uh, all the time when it, it was coming, it comes on, on, the same, on, on, the, on the same spot, on the same time. Like a wall. Like a wall, yes. Very fast. Very fast. And then uh, when, I, uh, when the, my, my building crops, then I move out. Then after that, I was taken by water going there and I tried to, to save myself on the, on, on the stuff of the tree, yes. The big question of course is how do we respond to all this disaster around us? Through the church network we were able to purchase about three tons of supplies that we've made up into leaf packs. These packs would exist of plastic candles and matches, some soya, some maize flour. The quickest response that we saw in the country towards this disaster was from the church and from church organizations because they are on the ground, they're grassroots organizations and they move fast. We've also been asked to facilitate the distribution of 10 tons of instant high nutritious porridge. It was donated by a church in Durban called City Hill Church and that's quite exciting because that means we could reach at least uh, two to three thousand families with the supplies that has been that's coming in now. I think it's a very good product that they've sent up because you can just add water to this porridge. It's instant porridge and it's it's high in protein and it will really be a blessing to the people. So the strategy the Lord gave us with this food distribution was to print vouchers for every pack of one kg cereal. This was the only way we could prevent rioting and pushing by giving out these vouchers. So we worked with the Evangelical Association of Malawi and through them we found some volunteers from different churches. We have received this voucher box. We are going into the community, in here in the community. We are going to distribute this for per family. So as you can see, the houses are broken down, the wall, the roof. Give him four vouchers. He's got six children that he needs to feed. He will recoup those vouchers for four bags of food that he'll be able to feed his family with.
this worked quite well. Um, although we still had to engage the police to maintain order and peace among the people. It was a lot of work, but in the end, it's the only way we could have done it. The beautiful thing about Malawi is uh, the culture that has really helped to become a safety net for people who are in need. If you go into the village now, you might find in real disaster areas where there's been a lot of flooding and people have really, thousands have lost their homes. Uh, there you'll find people in, in uh, tent, in tent camps that has been set up by the Red Cross and uh, other organizations. But uh, if you go into other areas where there's not been flooding and houses have partially fallen or some have totally fallen, you might find a few people congregated in a school, but most people that has been affected has been taken up in the community by friends and family. And that's how the culture here works. It's an extended family system. So you are not an individualist here. You, you're part of a big community and people take care of one another. If there's a funeral in the village, everyone goes. That's the power of community living. And so now at this moment, you might find 20 people sleeping on the floor in a small little room huddled together uh, and then in the daytime they go out and they go and work and trying to fix their houses, weeding their fields, trying to keep their crops growing. It's a beautiful thing about what we've witnessed here is the power of community. Another problem that people have encountered who live in the flooded areas is that they've lost all their fields. Everybody here are farming, so they depend totally on the on the income from their fields. Tandazodisimukubela <laughs> Quantin <laughs> Of course, it's great to help people with relief goods and those who are really in need to jump in and, and demonstrate the love of God to them in a practical way. But that's still not a solution for the long run. Because what if this scenario repeats itself next year and the year after that? So we have to look at what's the long term solution and I believe just as the culture was able to cushion a lot of the impact on personal lives as people were taking care of each other in this community living, in the same manner nature is able to cushion huge downpours like this if we honor the principles that's at work there. So that is exactly what we're trying to do here at the Crown Base, is we're trying to demonstrate that we can do things nature's way and the way we see in creation there's always a blanket covering the soil the soil is never laid bare there's always trees and that's shedding its leaves 
there's always a diversity of different, of different plants growing at the same place. So we believe with all this relief work that's going on, this is a great opportunity for us to share information, to inspire and to engage on a level that we, maybe we couldn't do before because people are now listening. These principles of nature, of mulching, of building the soil's structure by leaving the stove on the land, by not turning the soil, by doing crop rotations, keeping the soil fertility, and agroforestry. You may ask, well, how is it possible for us to implement all those principles in nature on a field and still farm profitably? Well, it's been proven that it is definitely possible. So this year, we have engaged for the first time with agroforestry on our property. We've planted at least 300 trees on this 2.6 hectares of land that God has put us as stewards over. And, and these trees are growing right in the fields at the moment with our crops. And within a few years, there will be large trees. And yes, they will create some shading, but they are awesome. They are nitrogen fixing trees. There's gonna be a symbiosis in my field between the crop that I want to harvest and the tree that I'm growing right in it. These nitrogen fixing trees are amazing. They can shed their leaves and the leaves that's very nutritious can enhance the soil fertility. They can create shading in the dry season when, uh, when the sun is beating down on the bare soil and also provide, of course, a source of blanket for the microbic life to be sustained even in this time when there's no rain. These trees can contribute tremendously to, to eliminating soil erosion as their roots are holding the soil together, especially if they are planted in the right places, on contour bands, etc., on steep slopes. The trees can also help with aeration of the soil as their roots are penetrating and helping with and creating cavities in our soil where the air can penetrate. It can also help with infiltration. It also helps, of course, creating oxygen and rain. And it's just beautiful to see. In a sense, this disaster was man-made. We know climate change is at hand, it's a reality. And that's all because of the intervention of man in nature. In another sense, we see how Many houses have fallen just because of poor building methods. People using, taking shortcuts, not putting in proper foundations, building with clay bricks and clay for mortar, and not putting proper roofs to protect the walls. And in another sense, the fact that we're burning all the stove, removing all the natural cover on the land, leaving the land bare and allowing the water just to cap the soil with the first few uh, hundreds of millimeters of rain and then the rest just running off. There was an interesting uh, storm trial done in the early 1980s in South Africa in KwaZulu-Natal at an agricultural research station called Sadara. They took uh, a 4% slope, they simulated 63 millimeters of rain within 30 minutes they had two trials. One was a mulch trial where the land was 100% mulched and the other one was bare land like conventional farming would have done it. And the interesting discovery was that on the bare land there was a 90% runoff of water and only a 10% infiltration rate. On the mulched land there was only a 6% runoff of water with a 94% infiltration rate and of course the trial went on towards evaporation rates and and erosion rates they discovered that on the bare land there was 30 ton of soil losses on one hectare just in that 30 minutes and on the on the mulch land there was only 600 kgs of soil losses on that slope now this is very significant because just imagine if the whole of Malawi's agrable land would have been mulched. Just, just imagine that, that we could 
reduce the runoff on our land tremendously, substantially. And just imagine where that water is going. It's going into the earth. It's going into a sponge that will absorb all this, um, this heavy downpours and the runoff will be so much less. The siltation in the sherry will be so much less just by doing one little thing that's mulching the land. I believe we have a lot to contribute and a lot to say. Let us all take part in this discussion and let us all contribute towards absorbing these kind of shocks in the future.